Hi, Yuli. Hi, Bob. How are you? Very well, thank you. Good. Let me introduce us. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show, available on both streaming video and via audio podcast. You are Yael Tamir. You are both a political scientist and a politician. You served in the Israeli Knesset. In fact, I think you were deputy speaker at one point. You've served in the cabinet as well. You were uh, minister of uh, immigration. Um, and you're also an academic, as I suggested. Uh, you're, you're, you're both, I think, president of a college in Israel. And you have, uh, you're on the faculty at Oxford. Is, that, is all of this right yeah. so far? So far, I've been the Minister of Education and the Minister of Immigration in Israel. And presently, I'm a president of a college here in Israel, and I'm teaching at the Blavatnik School of Government at Oxford. Okay. So no big errors so far on my part. I should also, I think I can also get the title of your book right. It's called Why Nationalism? That's what we're going to uh, talk about. Um, you're making the case uh, that uh, liberals should be more welcoming of at least a certain kind of nationalism than some of them have been. Um, you know, nationalism, ever since I can recall, has had kind of a bad reputation in liberal circles. Of course, nationalism has gone famously off the rails in some cases, as in uh, Germany in early and mid, uh, early and mid 20th century. Um, you know, I, I just, sometimes the distinction is made between nationalism and patriotism, and they say nationalism is bad, patriotism is okay. I've never been totally clear on what the distinction is. Maybe we can talk about that a little bit. But in any event, I think it's, the argument you're making in your book is that liberals should find a way to draw on the strengths of the nationalism that's being embraced by, for example, Donald Trump, Trump supporters, without succumbing to the pitfalls of nationalism, uh, some of which you might say they have, in fact, succumbed to. Is, is, that, is that all fair? Is that a fair summary so far? Yeah, I would say, first of all, that uh, liberalism and nationalism has been interacting for many, many years. The whole idea of national self-determination is a combination of the liberal idea of self-determination and the national desire to be self-governing. So it's not a new collaboration between the two ideologies. I know this um, collaboration has been suppressed, sometimes denied by liberals, uh, mostly after the Second World War, because nationalism became this monster everybody wanted to avoid. Uh, but sure enough, the basic features of the modern state have at least two legs. One is a liberal one, and one is a national one. You pull one leg out, and the whole structure collapses. So that, I think, um, is what is happening right now. Uh, neoliberalism, globalism has sort of pulled off the national leg and destabilized the political structure. And that is, uh, I think, both a liberal and a democratic, a progressive, I think, uh, uh, aspiration to bring the parts back together in order to have a trustworthy, functioning, uh, just uh, state. Okay. So, um, yeah, I mean, what you, this, this opposition between kind of globalism and nationalism is a framing you often hear. I gather one thing you mean by it is that, um, uh, globalization, um, and kind of just submitting to the dictates of globalization can deprive nation states of the power to make meaningful policy for one thing, right? I mean, is that, that's, that, that, that if you just, um, well, in the extreme, if you open, if you open yourself up to free trade entirely and, and open free immigration, although I think almost nobody is, is advocating completely open borders, but as a thought experiment, if you do both of those things, then the state loses, uh, loses the ability to make certain kinds of policy effectively. That's part of your concern, I gather. I think if you give up borders, and open the state up, then there is no state. Right. State is about sovereignty. It's about borders. It's about the social contracts that distinguish us from them. We owe obligation to each other, not only as human beings, but the citizen, because we contracted to work together for the well-being of our community. It's, this is the nature of uh, political democracy since its very beginning. It's about people coming together, creating a bonding that it has to work for the common good. 
unless you know who is the community, where are the borders, who works for whom. Uh, if people just move in and out all the time, there will be no, um, there will be no state, there will be no distributive uh, measures. Um, nobody would take care of the future generations because who knows where they'll grow. Nobody cares for the elderly because, you know, they are not our elderly because we have moved to another land. The, this is a kind of chaos that has, by the way, never happened in human right. history. But even the imaginary, you know, take a group of people and t- say every year 10% of you move to another group and try to build something that will last for generation and will build the kind of responsibility that we want to build in a modern state. And you'll see that it's not working. Right. So I guess to try to get a finer point on what it is that you think a lot of liberals are missing, okay? I mean, first of all, it isn't that there are really many of them for open borders. So we can take that off the table. I mean, I personally think the Democratic presidential candidates have not done a good enough job of conveying the fact that really none of them are for open borders per se, and there's a perception that they are, and that's a political problem. But the fact is that almost no one has ever said there should be no laws governing immigration into America and so on. So that, I I don't think that is really quite, um, you know. Can I interrupt you for a second? Sure. One of the things you said is really important. People, liberals, shy away from saying, we have a border, we have an immigration policy. Let's say what openly, what our immigration policy. So you will see what it is. Maybe it will be much less frightening if you know what it is, because it was never open. Let's see how we accommodate the people that we bring in. Putting it on the table is a major, major, I think, uh, obligation. And once liberal avoid this obligation, they lose the, 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 the public, not because of what they're doing, because of what they're not saying, because of what they're not really placing on the table. And that, I think, is a huge weakness of the liberal discourse of the last 20 years. Yeah, well, and I think particularly lately, uh, Trump has evoked such a strong emotional reaction that there's almost a tendency to define, for liberals to now define themselves as whatever Trump isn't. And and Mm -hmm. that uh, kind of complicates the the rhetoric. Uh, But what what Trump isn't, what Trump isn't, It's not to be hateful, not to tell people to go home to their, uh, back to their, uh, to the places they came from, not to insult people, but to have a policy. There's nothing insulting in having a policy. The opposite of Trump is not open borders. The open, the opposite of Trump is a decent policy. Okay. So, um, so in that case, I, I think we agree that what you're advocating is almost more clarity on the part of liberals uh, about what they actually are, are, are proposing. Um, but I assume there are some areas in which you're advocating change of a different kind or a change of attitude on the part of liberals. And so let's try to get clearer on that. I, I mean, and maybe we should start at some point soon in this conversation, I have to ask you to define um, nationalism I may, maybe this is as good a time as any. What's your what's your working definition of nationalism? Uh, generically, I mean, leave aside the, the 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 kind of it you are proposing. What 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 is the larger generic definition of nationalism you're working with? Okay, uh, nationalism is hard to define. One should say, uh, you know, experts call it a cluster definition. So there are different ways of being a nation, uh, but Nationalism is about a commitment to uh, a national group that is defined by either history, language, sometimes religion, uh, some sense of community, national consciousness. It's about an analysis of how we define ourselves. And um, usually, by the way, from within, it's very difficult to say uh, to other people that they are or they aren't a nation. Nations uh, are engaged in self-definition. That's the modern way of expressing yourself. And I think nationalism is the desire to take this nationhood and bring it into the political sphere and have political institutions that allows this expression to be uh, uh, intertwined with the political uh, sphere and the state that governs our life. Mm -hmm. And 
Do you make a distinction between nationalism and patriotism as is sometimes made? I mean, I'm sure you've heard the formulation I alluded to earlier, right? I'm not a nationalist. I'm a patriot. I don't know. I don't know what exactly that means. Does, is that a meaningful formulation to you? No, I, you know, it comes from, I think, um, uh, Macron said it recently. He echoes uh, other people who used to say it. I mean, in France, it used to be this kind of distinction between patriotism and nationalism. The truth of the matter is that patriots and nationalists behave very similarly. And historically, there's been no distinction between the two. Mm-hmm. Uh, both the, they find themselves as belonging to a particular group and give that group some priority, not because they think this group is superior or better, but because of their attachment to that group. So they are ready to do for that group unusual things because they believe in its Mm -hmm. viability, in its essence, in its culture, in its message, in its vision. It varies Mm -hmm. from one nation to another. Although the part about them not feeling that they're better, that their group is superior, I mean, that's, a, that's an element that you're advocating, I know. But as an historical matter, it often is the case that they think their group is better, right? I mean, I can tell you that in America, I live here, lots of Americans think uh, we're just better. And, and, and that has been the basis for a lot of foreign policy, including like invading countries and stuff. So... I, I mean, national, the generic definition of nationalism doesn't necessarily include that kind of modesty, right? It doesn't include modesty, but because nationalism is a general theory and it recognizes my right to nationalism and your right to nationalism and other people's right to nationalism, then it is, I mean, it allows you to take this distance between what you feel um, and between what is the reality? You know, I have grandchildren, like all grandmas. I think my grandchildren are exceptional. I'm I know sure that from uh, an external perspective, that might not be the case. If you ask me about my grandchildren, I would say, there's nothing like that in the world. But other grandparents said, eat it well. And when I say that, I don't think to, you know, I don't want to patronize them and say, no, 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 my children are really better. I understand that there is a perspective where it is for me, the best thing in the world and other people can have the same feeling and I don't challenge their feeling about their grandchildren or their nation or the thing they cherish. Okay. Yeah. So Obama, Obama kind of got yeah. into trouble for saying something like, yes, I'm an American exceptionalist. And as if I were born in France, I'd be a French exceptionalist. And he got criticized for that because that was like uh, an overly relativistic way to put it from the point of view of a lot of Americans. But you would think that that is in fact the way to put it. That's exactly the way to put it. So you, um, I, I want to keep keep honing in on like what it is that, that you would encourage, uh, for example, American liberals to be doing that they're not doing. But and, and maybe one step toward that is to talk about civic nationalism. That's a, a phrase you bring up and you say that's not what you're advocating. I gather civic nationalism is uh, a kind of subscribing like like you would you would say well i i subscribe to the american idea right there there are american traditional american values political values i subscribe to that's the basis of my patriotism or nationalism but it is not grounded in so much in 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 like religion ethnicity culture and so on as i understand you you're, you're saying it's it's naive to imagine a very a very effective and useful form of nationalism that is entirely divorced from from conceptions of cultural linguistic identity, right? And, and, and does that even extend to like uh, uh, religious and ethnic identity? Uh, there's a, there, um, what, what is your? Why don't you talk about that a little? I think the the mistake of civic nationalism is not to see the difference between. Uh, the different group. It's like, you know, there was this period where we talked about the melting pot. We bring everyone to the same place and somehow they, they become similar to each other. There are two uh, mistakes embedded in this ideology. One is that usually this just don't happen. <clears throat> People don't melt. They retain their identities. And there is a big difference uh, in their, you know, their ability to merge in the public sphere is different due to their religion, uh, race, ethnicity, gender, and so on. So erasing the, ignoring the differences 
very often place people actually in a less comfortable place than they would have been in a place where people say, this is our culture. I know that you're not part of it. And I recognize that it sometimes places you um, in a place that where you need some special consideration. Let, let me give you an example, okay? I think it will make it clearer. I um, went to Oxford. I graduated Oxford. Um, when you come to Oxford, people will not tell you, this is a Christian university. I'm Jewish, okay? Um, so when I graduated, and I'm a very secular Jew, extremely secular, uh, but when I graduated, they told me that I had to come to the provost of the university, Neil, and get my uh, degree by, you know, uh, he sort of marks a cross on you with the new testimony. That was too much for me. And I felt, you know, that's not what I wanted. So I said to them, is there an option for me? Can I do something else? And they offered me another way of accepting the degree. If they would say, no, that's universal, you know, you, you should feel part of it. This is like what we are, you know, this is the way to become a member. That would have forced me to do something that is extremely uh, difficult under the sort of the cover of neutrality. This is not Christian. This is the tradition. This is how we do it here. You can belong even if you're Jewish. No, you're not. And I want people to recognize the discomfort of minorities in the public sphere, something that civic nationalism, this allows you to do because it believes everybody is equal, everybody feels equal, everybody has equal opportunities. Neither of those things are right. So wait, let me get clear. I mean, you did resist the ritual and they did accommodate you. Yeah. And you're at, and so that is that is part of the nationalism you're advocating would be, uh, you know, attentive to my exceptions for minorities to that extent, at least. Mm-hmm. So then I guess but I they guess had like- first to recognize that they are not presenting to me a, a civic option or a neutral option, or a traditional option. They had to acknowledge the particularity of their own doings in order to allow my particularity to have a place. Okay, so I guess I'm, uh, I, I, I want to know then, what are you advocating for, say, American liberals? Because what you just advocated is, um, you know, followed far enough becomes a form of identity politics, right? Which you are very, I think, skeptical of, right? So, um, you, you know, in other words, I take you to be advocating to some extent an insistence that a national group does in fact have a common cultural identity. People who come to the nation must to some extent accommodate themselves to that identity, right? That, that, that you are not infinitely accommodating of minority um, traditions and interests. So, so I, I, you know, I, I would have expected you almost to welcome the idea of the melting pot because to some extent that's, that, that's the idea that, yes, America has a cultural identity. People who come have to, to some extent, assimilate themselves in it, right? So, I guess I'm asking, like, maybe we should just pick a policy in America. Uh, like, for example, it's now common to see in America, in public places, in certain parts of America especially, there will be a sign in English and a sign in Spanish, right? And I, I think it's safe to say that there are some Trump voters who resent that. It's not a huge burden on them, but, 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 but you know, actually at a, at a bank telling machine, it does sometimes mean they have to push one more button or they're on a phone and they have to push one more button and tell people what language they want. Um, and I think, so there is some resistance to that. Um, are, 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 you, are you saying American liberals should recognize the legitimacy of that resistance and say, yeah, if you're going to come to America, you better learn to speak English and, and do it fast? Or, or what, what, what is your position on that particular issue? Well, I think nations change and I think the debate about what's the national American national identity is a, an important one which hasn't been like the borders like the immigration which has been avoided uh, if you want to be um, you know nations should take a stand of what they are who, who they are and I can see nations saying uh, at some stage yes we are a nation America always been a nation of immigrants 
So we are more accommodating to immigrants than, let's say, the French, because the French have been very culturally oriented, linguistically oriented. Mm -hmm. So think about the difference between Quebec and the rest of Canada. Mm -hmm. It is rational for me that Quebec and the rest of Canada will have different policies because they have different ways of defining themselves. And I think for America to define itself, something that hasn't been done because the national language was sort of pushed aside is a big question. If, and, and there are many options. There's not one option of how you define yourself. And though it seems like nationalism preaches continuity, this continuity is very active because no nation has been the same for, you know, over generations. What I think is the problem is not the policy. It's even before the policy. It's really getting into this discussion of saying, okay, if we are a nation, what defines us? What uh, are the ob our obligations to our fellow nationals? How do we work together to create the common good? I think Americans should take the Trump uh, slogan, say, uh, you know, making American great again and just debate what is it to be great. And th But that is the language. And then, you know, I'm not American. I don't allow myself to judge what is the right way of being American. But I think if you don't get into this debate, somebody else is going to determine for you what is an American and you might not like it. And I think that's exactly what happens now. Being silent on an issue invites other people to make a decision. And then the only thing you do is you're against it. You're not producing something positive. You're just producing negatives. And negatives can never do a good political work. Okay. So you alluded to something there that I think is clearly a big part of your concern is that you're concerned about the cohesion of the nation state as a policy making instrument and, and as, um, as, as an instrument that can make a uh, policy that encompasses uh, the concerns of, of the people broadly so that there, so that people of various different economic classes can in fact be served by the government and feel included. Um, and this brings us back kind of to the question about what say American liberals should take away from your book, because I, I think they would all say they're with you there. I mean, all the presidential candidates ha in fact have policy proposals that depend on the cohesion of the nation state. They depend on the efficacy of the national government as a policy maker and implementer, right? But I guess I, I, maybe you think some, uh, some of them misunderstand what it takes kind of attitudinally, maybe, or something, right, to keep the national government uh, capable of, of doing that kind of thing. Is, is that part of it uh, th th that... Um, I mean, you, you tell me. I think uh, what is lacking is the dialogue, the political dialogue that convinces people uh, that the progressive democratic elites uh, are looking inwardly rather than externally. And that is something that you, you can bring one policy after the other and say, well, we've done this and this and that. But the language, and I think liberals allowed this language to go on for a long time without resenting that, and even sometimes even supported that, um, without being aware of the fact that for most citizens, the real contract is about what is happening in your own country. It's not about this allowing, you know, America to do things over its borders. It's not about rejecting the obligations of, uh, I don't know, global warming, but it's the priorities of the contract. The contract is about here and it's between us. And it's uh, the feeling, I think, that is created by a mislay, you know, sometimes by not using words, by not using a language, by not using symbols, you, um, you misrepresent your own views. I do believe most liberals and most progressive do care about the well-being of America, but it's enough to have a small elite that became, unfortunately, sort of the symbolic embodiment of this ideology that everybody says, okay, that's the liberal, you know, ideology. It's not. But if it's not, then go and fight for that ideology rather than allow this thing to continue. Right. So again, I mean, as with immigration, it sounds like to some extent you're talking about a perception problem more than a substance problem. I mean, not entirely, but but I think, you know, for American uh, liberals and progressives, it's a little frustrating that um, Trump has convinced 
uh, the white working class that Republicans are their rightful, the guardians of their interests and not Democrats. Because if you look at the policy history, Democrats have at least as strong of rec- a record of proposing policies that would actually benefit these people. That's a big frustration. Now, it's true that as it's happened, both the Democratic and Republican parties, um, you know, have to some extent bought into the logic of fairly free trade and globalization. And, and they both they both derive money and campaign contributions from the interests that that have bought into that. And so there, there is to some extent a problem there. But uh, but again, I think one thing you're saying is there's an actual there's a there's a perception problem, right, that, that Democrats they need to talk in a different way if they're going to successfully convince people that that their policies actually make sense for some Trump voters? It's talking in a different way. Um, it's actually going to different audiences. It's, uh, it's really doing the groundwork. I, I think that the, for many years, the ground, you know, the groundwork of politics in general, but certainly uh, among progressives, have been sort of pushed aside. And there is a, a necessary uh, organizational, I would say, aspect of it, of how you gain trust, how you go to the people. Uh, you know, liberals he, in Israel, in Europe, uh, also I think in the United States, very often uh, relied on the court rather than on educating the people. So it's not about only about the perception. It's about really fighting for a new basis for your political uh, ideology that would resonate with the people who want, uh, you want, uh, will support you and vote for you. You can't just uh, rely on people continuing to do what, you know, people say, okay, there's a swing vote, so how do people swing? Uh, people have reasons why they swing from one side to another. And if they vote uh, for Trump, you have missed something very important. So rather than being angry at both Trump and Trump voter and mocking them, you should understand what you've done wrong because mockery is not a strategy. Mockery, sometimes, you know, it's funny, but it's not a strategy. So the, the discursive element of politics, for me as a political theorist, is extremely important. So what what are there specific things you would encourage? And I I'm, apologize for continuing to dwell on America. And I do actually want to turn to Israel because Israel's relationship to nationalism is so distinctive and, and in some ways so different from America's. But, um, uh, and I know in the book you write about French nationalism and, and so on. I, I think it's, it seems to me like you're, you're concerned with the fate of nationalism and the nation state in the West very broadly in particular. Um, but uh, to, to dwell on America for a little longer, are there specific things you would recommend democratic politicians say or um uh and and you know i should say i I, maybe i didn't explicitly say in israel you have been on the left side of politics you were you were in the labor party um you i think were a founder of peace now is that right a co-founder of peace now which is uh certainly a left of center long-standing advocate of a two-state solution um the uh so are are there you know were the particular if you could write the speeches for american democratic presidential candidates are there specific things we haven't touched on yet that you would have them actually say well i think the 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 ground is shifting anyhow i mean but more talk about you know uh, you know putting your country uh, fellow first about uh, social justice and distribution, about recognizing the fate of the middle classes, about borders and immigration, about all the real issues. I'm not saying anything new. I think by now everybody knows that these issues should be attended. Uh, what I'm trying to do is to fit them into a theoretical framework because a lot of people say, oh, if we pick on that issue or that issue, this is not, you know, it's a compromise. It's not my theory, but I would sort of you know, succumb to this just in order to get voters. I'm saying, no, go back to the theory and see that this is the natural outcome of what we believe as progressive, as liberals. And if you allow the merger of liberalism and nationalism together, you will get a coherent discourse that I think is more convincing than just a policy here and there to answer a specific uh, audience or to make a specific statement. So it it is actually a call to... uh, make a coherent statement about what it is that we're searching to achieve. And I think a lot of those things are already out there 
but they need to be structured. Mm. So uh, I guess one thing you're saying is, A, yes, Democrats should come up with policies that actually address the concerns of uh, a lot of people who supported Trump. But in addition, they should say things that dispel the idea that they don't feel a genuine sense of identity with their country and camaraderie with exactly. their fellow Americans. The, the, the perception you think is still out there that uh, democratic elite, you know, these liberal elites feel as closely affiliated with European elites as with the American working class, right? Which I, I think actually is a real thing in both parties. I, I think elites generally these days feel pretty globalized in their identities. But, but anyway, you're saying that that is, um, that, that's a, that's the, is that the heart of the perception problem you want to address? I think, yes. You know, I know uh, what I'm claiming in the book is unlike, uh, you know, Marx was uh, right about a lot of things, but he thought the proletariat would get together. Actually, the elite got together and the, pro- the, the people are sort of separated and are fighting within themselves. And the elites have the responsibility to go back and take, you know, a, a leading role within their community, something that was very common in the, you know, certainly in the previous century, but also in, in, in this uh, in, in the beginning of this century, if you are an elite, it comes with an obligation to your own people. That, I think, is an important part of nationalism, that, you know, people are connected, and being an elite has, uh, has given you a chance, but also an obligation that you have to fulfill. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think Republicans have done a good job of making what you're suggesting challenging. Um, you know, first of all, there's really a long-standing campaign going back at least to the 80s. And this was pioneered in part by, well, Dan Quayle, who was vice president, Newt Gingrich, of actually systematically trying to convince Americans that liberal elites are not truly American. They don't truly have American interests at heart. They have contempt for the, the values of everyday Americans. There's really been a systematic effort. That's part of the, the problem. But there's also... Uh, I mean, you tell me, like, what I should do in a situation. I mean, Republicans are good at framing uh, tests of national allegiance in these very ideological ways that make them hard for liberals to buy into. So, for example, um, at, it's common now at American sporting events. It's long been common to sing the national anthem. I grew up in that America. But we do like more and more of that. Like now at baseball games, ever since 9-11 in the seventh inning, instead of uh, singing – uh, take me out to the ball game. They sing God bless America, even though they've already sung uh, the national anthem at the, at the beginning. Okay, fine. But, but, but what uh, the, the, the part I have most trouble with is the, uh, the now pretty routine displays of military power at athletic events in America. So it's not uncommon to have like a flyover of fighter jets at the Super Bowl. And one thing we found out, by the way, is that the Pentagon is actually paying for that. They're actually subsidizing they're paying for these things sometimes as, as, as like commercials. And, you know, there I have to get off the boat. I'm sorry. I, I think that the, the uncritical uh, support of American military intervention has gotten America and the world in a huge amount of trouble. And, but you see that the position this puts uh, somebody like me in is like the, the Republicans are framing patriotism as one and the same with the support of an aggressive military policy. And, and they're doing it really skillfully. So it's like, do you understand? I mean, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> well, first of all, you know, when, uh, I, when Trump uh, uh, was elected, everybody said America is going, into a, is going to go into a period of actually disengaging itself from military intervention around the world. So it's not clear exactly where the military intervention is going to be on the liberal uh, Republican, uh, you know. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I was skeptical and said on Twitter, I think he's going to be swallowed by the American foreign policy establishment. That's my prediction. I think that's largely not entirely happened. But anyway, go ahead. Uh, no, so I'm, I'm just saying this thing about military intervention is not necessarily Republican or Democrat. It's, it's I agree. More complicated. It's more complicated than that. But military symbols and especially wasting money of that. I mean, what if people would stand there and say, look at this, you know, airplanes? We could have gotten your school, a baseball uh, yard for that. 
And you didn't. You deserve a baseball yard for your school, whatever. I'm just inventing. Rather than two minutes of a flyover. And that is more important to our community. This is our commitment to this community. We'll fight for that. That's a language that for me is totally localized, uh, you know, uh, shows your commitment and it's not militarized. It's not, you don't have to, our problem, and I, we have the same problem in Israel, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm well aware of this problem. You just don't, if you play their game, you're losing. If you create your game, using the virtues of, of, of this communal uh, affiliation, you might be winning because I'm sure there's something in your community that when the flyover goes over, if you, if you just get flyers and say, this is instead of that, some people will look back and say, ah, that's not a really great idea for us. Okay. Now, are you, is one thing you're doing in your book, I, I think maybe you almost say as much, but uh, arguing that, the nationalism, Trump's nationalism, you don't approve of it in all of its dimensions, and the nationalism you advocate would not share all of its dimensions. But um, or is one thing you're saying, it's actually a rational reaction, and people need to understand that, 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 that the nationalism Trump represents is a not surprising reaction of people who are pursuing their legitimate interests. I'm not saying that about Trump, but I'm saying that about his voters. And I think there's a big distinction between Trump and his voters. I think it's a mistake to think that the voters um, are irrational. Uh, I think that the voters were rebelling uh, to make a voice being heard, something that democracies should have been allowing them to do many years ago. And that voice was the voice of dissatisfaction of something that has been um, kept, uh, you know, under the carpet. So that, that I'm not for Trump, but I think that dismissing his voters, saying they're all narrow-minded, rednecks and so on, first of all is wrong, and second is totally uh, unproductive uh, from the point of view of, of making uh, somehow a recovery for the liberal progressive camp. People uh, do not appreciate the fact that you mock them. Mm -hmm. And underlying your th this kind of sympathy for the position of the Trump voter, is there a view of human nature? In other words, one thing you hear sometimes is like one argument you hear is some people say, look, you don't understand. People are always going to uh, have a certain kind of ethnic allegiance. For example, that's one one view. There's a spectrum of views on what human nature does and doesn't dictate. But one um, kind of defense, I guess, of the, the Trump uh, attitude, you might say, that you hear, or the, the attitude of Trump voters, is um, people are always going to pay attention to skin color. That's uh, one extreme. Or religion is always going to be important. Or, and this is a different claim, there's some limit to the rate of change that people can assimilate, right? Like, it's, there's some limit to how fast the demographics of a country can change without your getting blowback. So there's a range of claims about human nature that are made in assessing this whole situation. Is there a view of human nature that underlies your argument? Yes, there is. The only uh, claim that I'm making, though, is that there is not a human nature for rednecks and human nature for liberals. It, we all, in a particular situation, could be uh, exposing different kind of attitudes. Uh, so, uh, you know, elites placed in a particular position could be as nationalist as, you know, uh, people on the other side, and people may be given the opportunity to be in another position. I say uh, my claim is a positional one. What makes you or what positions you on this continuum of the national global sort of uh, uh, continuum is um, not your nature, but it's your circumstances. And it's easier to be a globalist where you benefit from it, and it's easier to be a nationalist when you think you benefit from it. And we're all sort of, without saying that, calculating our risks and opportunities. And strangely enough, uh, we come out with a position that um, serves well our interests. So uh, this is not so surprising that the people who are on the global side have been able to enjoy globalism, where the people on the other side have been completely uh, remained out of the game. Uh, the class thing, the, the social thing here is extremely important. So human nature is universal, but the circumstances are different. 
And, and one more question about Trump supporters. In America, there's an argument that is put in perhaps uh, overly simple terms, typically, but it's like, well, is the explanation for their support for Trump about economics? Is that the best explanation? The economic situation they found themselves in and the perception that he could help? Or is it more about their attitudes toward race? I mean, that, that's the stark version of the debate. I think it's, uh, that's an overly simple way to frame the debate. But, but do you, do you have a position on that debate or anything to say about it? I'm sure you're aware of it. Yeah, I think we never determine our position according to one factor or never it's too much, but usually we don't determine our position according to one factor and race and social status and the change, the fast change in the society and your opportunities and your risks and your community and your religion, they all filter in. I mean, it's very simplistic to say it's about this or that. Usually uh, you calculate the different aspects of uh, the things that are important to you, the things you care about, and somehow you come up with a position. Uh, so um, it's never only about race or about class or about identity. Uh, I don't know about many sort of real-life situations where we reduce everything to mm -hmm. one aspect. Okay. Um, I want to talk very quickly about global governance, something you don't mention. You drew, you, you, well, you don't pay much attention to it in the book. The... the um, the uh, you draw the distinction between kind of globalism and nationalism, and you see uh, the, the the current kind of tension is largely being between globalists and nationalists. Um, and uh, I, I mean, I I, uh, I I mean, let me just say, I think of myself as in some ways a globalist, certainly to the extent of thinking that globalization brings a lot of good and in the sense of, of thinking that we actually do need to nurture global governance. But by virtue of, you know, at the same time, I, I think the nation state needs to remain coherent as an actor. I don't imagine global government replacing the nation state. I mean, nation states are the building blocks of global governance. Global governance consists largely of agreements among nation states. Um, and in some ways, is a way of them to reckon with technological forces that are eroding their sovereignty and a way for them to reclaim, in a certain sense, some control over their future. But um, more specifically, you say in the book, the workers of the world are never going to unite. And I I'm not sure that global governance can't be a mechanism for, for workers across borders to realize some common interests. And actually, Trump brought us an example with a, with a uh, and I wanted to run this by you with um this is a provision in his renegotiated NAFTA which hasn't yet been uh, approved by Congress but in any event it was supported both by American labor unions and by Mexico's uh, left-wing governor and what it was was uh, a rule that um, for cars to qualify for free trade status under NAFTA you know, a certain amount of the labor that went into them had to be at a certain minimum wage. And, and, and the way the, the way it was going to work was from the American workers point of view, that means it's harder to kind of undercut their wages. Mm -hmm. But actually, there was support uh, in Mexico uh, on the left because they thought that would force Mexican factories to pay a higher wage. Now, obviously, there's going to be losers in both cases. There's going to be some Mexican workers who just don't get a job. But but still, the idea was that there would be more jobs at a respectable wage and so on. Is that kind of thing, you don't get into that. Is that not, you, do you not imagine workers uniting in, in, in to steer global governance to the left in, in these fashions? I imagine exactly as you described, government defending workers by making such agreements. And as you rightly said, most of globalism uh, is agreement between states. I think when a globalism went sour, it's when either the mega companies or individuals uh, broke the state framework and did things for themselves. So when state negotiates, 
uh, on a global level. That's a very welcome thing. It's a necessary thing. There's no other way of proper globalism. And that's exactly the example that you gave. It's a, a, an excellent example because it needs to be legislated and it needs to be enforced and you need the government for that. So if two governments agree on that, that's very welcome. And it comes from each and every one of them trying to protect their own workers. And this is where the, the interests coincide. And it's, it's a great thing to do together. Okay. So I said we'd talk a little about Israel just because it is so um, distinctive, if not unique, in its uh, relationship to nationalism. So, um, I mean, first of all, you know, the term ethno-nationalism has come into currency mm -hmm. as a way of describing what uh, unites Trump and a number of European leaders. Um, it's, I guess, it's a little less toxic than white nationalism in its connotations, which is white nationalism being like an officially kind of hateful movement. Um, but it's, it's a, ethno-nationalism is a term that's, um, uh, for a lot of people, carries negative connotations. And, and I guess my question is, is Israel, uh, is it an avowedly ethno-nationalist state by virtue of defining itself as a Jewish state? I, I, I mean, it is, it has, a, it has an explicit relationship to ethnicity that is not shared in, by, in America and in a lot of nations, right? Yeah, Israel is a special case because it defined itself as a Jewish state and Jewishness is defined in religious terms or in um, ethnicity is not the right term. If you've seen Jews together, they're not of one ethnicity, but they are. Uh, uh, it's a religious definition. It's a historical definition. And in, in, in the Jewish aspect of the state, uh, Israel is expressing that uniqueness of the Jewish religion, nationhood, that are so closely intertwined that it's hard to differentiate between them. And by the way, I just as a footnote, I assume that as a social scientist, you define ethnic broadly enough to encompass religion as well as race. I mean, that's commonly done in the social sciences, although kind of lay people often think of ethnicity as, re as referring only to race, but you're using it broadly, right? Yeah. Yeah, w which I would as well. Um, well, it's funny, you, um, what you just said brings to mind something that is commonly said about Israel, is that if you look at the internal tensions, um, and one of them that's grown is between the ultra-Orthodox and the more secular, as, as mm -hmm. kind of symbolically represented in a kind of Jerusalem versus Tel Aviv uh, mm -hmm. imagery, um, it's commonly said that if they didn't have so many external enemies, the nation would would fall apart, right? Is that... Well, unlike America, we are engaged in an ongoing debate about who we are and what it is to be Jewish, and we deeply disagree about it. And uh, it's a historical disagreement. It never uh, ended in 3,000 years of Jewish history. And that is a, a major concern and a major divide in Israel. It's exactly about what it is to be Jewish. And once you know what it is to be Jewish, you can say what a Jewish state is, because my Judaism and ultra-Orthodox Judaism have very little in common. So it's a, it's a big debate in Israel, and it is a major cause of uh, public and political schisms in the country. And it's not totally unlike the debate in America, right? I, I mean, there's a religious right, and there's a more secular uh, group that is on balance to the left of the religious group, right? Yeah, it's, I think it's different because um, uh, sort of Judaism, even the debate is kept within the Jewish community and it's a very historical one and it's a very, um, you can, uh, you know, it's very similar to, uh, you know, acts of, uh, Disagreements within religion, think about process of reformations, about religious wars within religions. Uh, less of the American case, I think uh, the Israeli case is, is a religion going to a transformation more than a nation going to a debate about its boundaries. It, it's complex. Israel is complex in that respect. Yeah, and I'm, sure, I'm sure that I assume one side in Israel accuses the other of not wanting to just... Re, uh, not just having a different conception of religion, but in effect defining religion out of existence, right? I assume that's the accusation from the ultra-Orthodox is that the, the secular Jews aren't religious at all. Well, 
hard not to be Jewish, even if you are secular. Uh, it's hard to leave the religion, but that, that they're not observing. And so it's, it's again, it's another, dif- it's a different kind of a debate about what it is to be Jewish and how observant you have to be in order to be Jewish. You are Jew- you've, you're born Jewish and you die Jewish unless you convert. Uh, but it's about your observance. So again, Israel, I think, a little bit like Islamic countries, is, is different right. in its attitude to religion and what it is that they're debating. Right. It, it has something in common with with actually uh, with Islamism, not in the not in the ra- not in the radical sense, but in the sense of a conception of governance. Yeah, exactly. Unfortunately, the Middle East has a, a different kind of uh, attitude uh, to the relationship between uh, church and state or religion and state. So mm-hmm. um, that, uh, you know, this this brings up. Uh, the su- a subject you address in the book is the the, the subject of national narratives. Mm-hmm. You know, part of uh, nationalism is to have a story about yourself and your history. And as you say, there's a tendency for the stories to be false or at least not entirely true. And uh, as you are aware, that can get out of hand. I mean, one problem you face with Israel and Palestine is that they both have their stories about how they got to where they are now. They're different stories. Neither is an objectively, uh, you know, constructed story. They clash consequentially. And, and, and there are at least some people on both sides who take their version of the story um, as reason to, as warrant for, you know, violence or oppression or whatever, something you would not approve of, right? So how do you, um, so, so on the one hand, you are, you are endorsing the idea of a national narrative and even a national narrative that isn't wholly true, right? And yet these things can get out of hand. Well, everything can get out, can get out of hand. I think uh, every ideology can get out of hand. Um, that, that's not something that is unique to nationalism. Uh, but in the particular case of narratives, yes, uh, national narratives are invented. Uh, I think for me, that's the one fascinating fact about nationalism. We all know national narratives are invented and still they're very effective, maybe like love. You know, we know love is invented, but it captures our imagination and maybe structure our lives. So we're more emotional beings than we think we are. Um, and the greatness of uh, liberal nationalism is as I said about my grandchildren earlier, I would say about my national narrative. For me, that's my narrative, but I'm well aware that there are other narratives. And I think that the competition of which one is the absolute truth, we're all going to lose because none is the absolute truth. Acknowledging that, that is for me the most important thing and probably also the most, uh, you know, the, the, the most deep and demanding educational challenge is to be, Committed, and yet not dogmatic. And that's not simple to be, but I think it's uh, necessary. Okay. So um, in, in kind of uh, moving our conversation to a close, I wanted to ask you about a dichotomy you, you talk about. Um, I, I think you believe that some people are onto something when they suggest that the choice we face is between a kind of a world oligarchy Right, which which would be the result of just the untrammeled play of the forces of globalization and a state patriotism on on the other hand. Is that a is that a fair yep. is that too stark a description of the way you see the choice? Yeah, I think that's exactly the choice. I think uh we have to um choose between, you know, the free market, neoliberalism, hyper globalism, it has many names now has created this uh, global oligarchy. And I think it is, um, you know, the outcome of that process has not been trickling down like a lot of people told us, the rich get richer and then everybody's getting to enjoy it. But of a small group getting very rich and the rest of the population being less well off, and it's our obligation to change the trend and go in the other way. Okay. Um, And so... uh you know, as a matter of policy, which we haven't gotten into all that much, I guess you are fine with uh, some of the things you hear on the left of the Democratic Party about uh, taxing taxing the rich more heavily than they're being taxed, maybe much more heavily as, say, Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren might propose. 
that, that, that's something that would uh, distinguish you from the Trumpian nationalism, at least as it's played out, although apparently Steve Bannon is a big advocate of taxing the rich, but leaving that aside, um, you, you know, I, 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 you're, it, what you're not saying is it's either world oligarchy or Trump, Trumpian nationalism. It, no. it, it, um, you're saying that a kind of nationalism is a prerequisite for policies that uh, the left favors. Absolutely. That, you know, I think that uh, this is the gap. We can't live with just world oligarchy and Trump. We need to fill the gap. This is our responsibility if we want to go back. And by the way, I think that we're going to see um, a blurring of this distinction between right and left. There will be people on the Republican right that will support things that were commonly seen as left-wing, like state intervention and so on. There will be people on the left who would be supporting more what called, used to be right-wing, like limiting immigration. So I think the, the, born, the boundaries are going to be blurred, and this is a good moment to uh, redefine your theory and redefine your policy because the old game is not going to be effective. You need a new one, and now you have to write the rules. Right. And I think if Trump had been a different kind of person, he could have uh, once elected, actually created more of a crisis for the Republican Party and the Democratic Party by actually, uh, you know, forcing some kind of realignment of the kind you're, you're talking about. Right. Right. I um, think that certainly going to be the case, not only in the United States, it's happening now in all the Nordic countries. It's happening now in Europe. Probably it, uh, it will happen in the UK. It even happens in Israel. There's no left and right. Traditionally, uh, things have been, you know, divided very clearly. It's now being restructured, and it's uh, a moment of, of, of reflection. Oh, is that right? I mean, I know the, the Labor Party has been on its heels for a while, but I, I didn't realize you were seeing, I mean, are you seeing within the Netanyahu coalition support for more progressive uh, economic policy and stuff like that? No, but the, the, the Netanyahu government, no, but there are parties now that are trying to be crossing the borders between right and left on different, uh, you know, issues like uh, the new right would be more, for example, for gay rights. Uh, the people on the left, we, uh, so, so things are sort of shaking. Uh, mm -hmm. But our, other countries have gone through a much more, I think, um, a comprehensive process of restructuring politics. Israel is beginning to experience that as well. Right. Okay. Um, well, is there, so is there anything else you want to say about the book before we close? It's called Why Nationalism, published by uh, Princeton University uh, Press, publisher of some great books. Um, I've actually been listening to it on audio. It's, so there is an, there is an audio uh, version available. Uh, I would say judging by the accent of the narrator, it's not you. No, um, uh, <laughs> I wish it was, but no. <laughs> someone who uh, who has spent more, even more time in Britain than you have, I think, is is the narrator. Uh, but is there anything else you want to say about the book? Uh, first of all, the Juliet Stevenson, the, the narrator, is wonderful. I wish I had mm -hmm. her English. Um, uh, um, I, I think that uh, it's uh, really being a political activist. This is for me a call for action. I would like people to see it as a way of. Uh, asking for a moment what they could do in order to uh, make things better rather than becoming depressed, which is the common thing now about liberals, uh, rather than being uh, to feeling like this sense of uh, all these people who don't support us just misunderstand what's good and bad, just go out and listen. It's about listening and then restructuring your ideas. And if you do that, uh, you know, I remain optimistic that we can uh, recapture the important things and change the political structure. Okay. Um, and uh, is there somewhere online that people can find you and your work? Are you on Twitter or anything? Or, I mean, they can always... They write Yael Yuli Tamir. They'll find all my works. Right. Um, and if you, they go on Tamir Yuli on Yahoo, very simple. That's my email. People can write to me and I will be very happy to engage in dialogue. Okay, so that's, uh, we should be clear, there are two different names here. <laughs> so your official name and, the, and the, your byline on the book is Yael Tamir, Y-A-E-L-T-A-M-I-R. That's the thing to Google. But if they want to email you, uh, then your nickname, Yuli, comes into play. And did you say that that is uh, T-A-M-I-R-Y-U-L-I at Yahoo? Yes, it is. Dot com. Okay, 
So those are your coordinates. The book is Why Nationalism. And uh, thanks so much for taking the time and good luck with the book. Thank you very much.